Two teenage girls in Australia would leave their campsite to go to a nearby friend's house for a party. Not but a few hours later, there would be a massive search party looking for them. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Bega schoolgirls' disappearance. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. <laughs> <laughs> Pictured next to me was Lauren Margaret Berry and Nicole Emma Collins. Lauren was born on October 11th, 1982, and Nicole was born on November 14th, 1980. The two teenage girls lived in the Bega area of Australia. Lauren and Nicole were best friends since childhood. They were described as being inseparable. Two peas in a pod, if you will. They were basically incredibly close and almost like sisters since the very day they met. They both had a love and a passion for life. They were described as two kids who wouldn't let anything get them down. They just sort of took things as they come in life. They shared a love of horses and animals, and they also had a passion for friendship and loyalty. Their families would describe them as being kind of like wise beyond their years. They had beautiful souls. They surrounded themselves with only the best of people. They didn't care like what grade you were in. They let you hang out with them. Um, they, they never like ignored younger or older siblings. Um, they just sort of hung out with anyone. They were explorers. The two girls loved to go into the nearby like woodland areas and explore unseen areas. They also loved going to the beach and swimming. And both were very fond of camping. It was Labor Day weekend in Australia, October 3rd, 1997. The two best friends were going to celebrate the holiday as well as Lauren's upcoming birthday. They were going to go to a campgrounds and just sort of camp over the weekend. And it was Nicole's father who would arrange the campsite and set everything up for them. He set it up at a place called White Rock. And that was only about two miles, a little less than two miles from where uh, Nicole lived. The campsite was so close, in fact, that the girls were able to kind of just head back to the house to change or take a shower. Um, so they were kind of kind of ca camping, kind of not. <laughs> there was also a phone available at the campsite. And with that, they were able to call to Nicole's house to check in with them to make sure everything was going good. They could call the campsite to speak to the girls whenever they wanted to. Again, just for safety to make sure everything was okay. Given how close the campsite was to Nicole's home, um, and the area also was considered super safe, so the, the families didn't really have any concerns about the girls being down at this campsite, you know, on their own. By all accounts, according to the family, the girls, every time they checked in or stopped by the house, the everything was going great at the campsite. They were having a really good time. They were exploring. They were just really kind of just out there being themselves, being little explorers. But sadly, that would change very quickly. On October 5th, 1997, there was a party going on at a nearby friend's house, uh, pretty close-ish to where the campsite was. So Nicole would call the house and say, hey dad, we're gonna go to a friend's house for a party they're having. It's just, you know, uh, a mile or so away from the campsite and the dad said okay that's fine just check back in when you guys get back to your uh, campsite. Nicole spoke to her father sometime around 9 p.m. that night and that would be the last time that anyone heard from the girls ever again. Lauren and Nicole never got to the party. Several hours later, after he had not received a call from Lauren or Nicole, um, the father called the campsite to see what was going on, but no one answered the phone. He also knew whose friend's house they were supposed to be going to, so he called there. They said the girls never even showed up. They're not here now, and they never got here. 
So Nicole's dad then, of course, drove to the campsite. It was just down the road, basically. Um, and there was no sign of Lauren or Nicole. Their stuff was all there. Um, their clothing, their bags, you know, everything was still there. But the girls were not. And then he himself did like a cursory search of all of the surrounding area. He drove around for a bit. He couldn't find them. So obviously going into parent panic mode, he would phone police and report the girls missing. The search for them started basically right away. It started that night. They got family, friends, police, volunteers, and they searched and they searched and they searched. This search lasted for days and they found nothing. They left no stone unturned. They checked everywhere the girls could have possibly have been. You know, maybe they fell down something and they got stuck. Weeks would go by with no sign, no trace of the girls. You know, police would interview people who lived in the area of the campsite. They would interview people from the party the girls were supposed to go to, just in case maybe they were lying about them not showing up. But they really didn't find anything. Um, they didn't catch anyone in a lie. The girls were just gone. A couple of weeks later, um, after they searched and searched, on October 25th, 1997, the investigation would change. On the afternoon of October 25th, the police would find an abandoned or seemingly abandoned vehicle. It was like this little uh, gray Ford Telstar. Uh, I've never heard of that before, but, um, and it was a car that had been reported stolen uh, a while back. The car was found in an area called Canberra, if I said that correctly. When they looked in the car, they found a map of the Biga area, especially the campsite the girls were staying at. Um, and also in the vehicle, they found belongings that belonged to by a, a known criminal by the name of Lindsay Beckett. This car had also been observed the night of the girl's disappearance as being in the Biga area. Um, they didn't know it was this exact car, but it was a car that looked just like this one that people had spotted. Lindsay Beckett was known very well by police. He had a rap sheet. They also knew that he ran uh, with a guy by the name of Leslie Camilleri, and he was another known criminal. So with regards to the car being stolen, they bring in Beckett to question him about that. Um, and just because of the circumstances, they also questioned him with regards to the two teenage girls who are missing. Beckett, he acknowledged that he stole the vehicle along with uh, his friend Camilleri, but he denied any involvement to do with the missing girls. Given both men's rap sheets and just sort of how everyone knew these two men in the area, they would fit the description of people who may have taken the girls and done something to them. But they had no proof. They just really were just doing their due diligence by asking them. They would then also bring in Camilleri. They would arrest both men for the auto theft. Um, and again, they would question them over and over again um, with regards to the girls, but they just adamantly denied it every single time. That being said, police could feel that Beckett seemed to have been feeling the pressure. Um, it appeared that he was kind of close to possibly breaking on something. And of all things in the world, it would be a pink television that would get him to start talking. You see, when the two girls went missing, there were people who were driving along the same road the girls would have been walking on to get to the party. Um, and people around a little after 10 p.m. who were driving on that road observed a pink television sitting on the side of the road, kind of near where the girls were camping. The TV thing, it felt like a very random thing. It felt like a, a, a nonsense tip that wouldn't lead to anything. But they would be wrong. So desperate for anything, any kind of answers, police would begin to look into this TV. They start to question a lot of uh, Camilleri's and Beckett's known associates. Um, and actually one of them um, is an informant for the police. So they bring that informant in. And when they question him, 
Bingo. This informant told police that on the same night the girls went missing, Camilleri and Beckett had gone to his house and he was, the informant, was trying to purchase drugs from them. And the informant didn't have any money. So Camilleri said, well, I'll take that, that television um, as a form of payment. So the informant was like, okay, yeah, fine, take it. So Camilleri took the TV and he put it in the back of a vehicle and that vehicle had been stolen by Camilleri just a few hours earlier. Now, by some unbelievable miracle, the informant had the serial number of this TV. So police, again, not expecting anything to come from this, they traced the serial number, thinking that no one would have registered that number anywhere. But someone did. They found the TV at a local hotel and it was no longer pink because the hotel had uh, spray painted it or something uh, black. So police would ask the hotel staff, where did you get this TV? Well, it was turned in by uh, some random person um, and then we picked it up from a, like some sort of shop. Um, and so they were able to find out that where the TV was picked up from, the person who who donated it basically, said, oh yeah, I found it on the side of the road um, near the White Rock campsite. Uh, and police were like, whoa. So what this does is it puts the pink TV in the exact place where the girls disappeared, which means, and police know that the pink TV at that time was in possession of Camilleri and Beckett. So they were able to now place them at the scene of the crime, basically. They question Camilleri again, and he's like, no, I, I'm not confessing to anything. I didn't do anything. I wasn't even there, wasn't in the area, sorry. But Beckett was a different story. He was already starting to show signs of caving, and he finally did. The evidence of the TV is what got him to break, and he would end up confessing. So he sat down with police, and he said, everything that happened that night. And the following is an account from Beckett himself as to what occurred that evening. And I want to give you a kind of a bit of a warning here. Uh, some of the details I'm going to go into are pretty graphic. Um, so I just want to give you a, a fair sugar warning about that. So on the night of October 5th, 1997, the two men had already stolen the Ford Telstar vehicle. They then got the TV from the informant. And then they began to just sort of drive around the area, just sort of aimlessly, recklessly. They were drinking. They were also injecting amphetamines. They were high out of their minds and they were just, they didn't know what they were doing. Around 10 p.m. that night, they were driving down uh, Bega and Tathra, uh, a road um, which was near the campsite and the two men spotted two teenage girls walking on the side of the road so they pulled up along next to them. The two men would have a conversation with the girls and eventually they were able to convince the girls to get in the car. Now the back seat um, had this big pink TV in it and it wouldn't fit in the trunk. So the men had to take the pink TV out and put it on the side of the road in order for the girls to sit in the back. So that's why it was on the side of the road. Another uh, sketchy thing about the car was that the Camilleri had put the child locks on for the back of the car. So if the girls tried to open the doors, they wouldn't be able to get out. And also the wheelers for the windows, because this is like an old school car, um, they were missing. They weren't even there, so no one could roll down the windows if they wanted to. Camilleri, who was driving the car, he began to just try to drive around with the girls. They were talking, and then he pulled into uh, Tathra Beach, and the four of them got out of the car, and they just sort of hung out at the beach, drank a little bit, you know, just casually hung out. And then they get back into the car, and they start to drive back towards the campsite, and at some point... Uh, something happens with the car that Camilleri gets pissed off about. Um, and so he takes out his drug and alcohol-fueled anger on the girls for some reason. 
he started to scream and yell at them, and the girls were, like, freaking out, like, okay, we'll just get out of the car then. So when the car was stopped, the girls tried to open the doors, but they couldn't. They, then they couldn't roll down the windows either, and they're kind of freaking out at this point. Then Camilleri turns around, and he takes a knife out of his pocket, and he points it at the girls and says, he said, shut up, do what I tell you to do, and I won't stab you. He then made Beckett take out his knife and point it at the girls so that Camilleri could continue driving and the girls would shut up, I guess, because the knife. Camilleri then drove the vehicle around the area and he made several stops to several secluded locations where at each stop they would both take turns sexually assaulting the two teenage girls. Sometimes they would sexually assault them um, in the back seat of the car while the other man was driving around. Sometimes they would stop at a destination and force the girls out and assault them. Um, but they did this like four or five different times over the course of several hours. They would hit the girls or threaten to stab them if they didn't cooperate. So the girls, they, they did what they thought they could do to survive. And then at one point, um, the girls were crying and asking and just flat out asked them, are you going to murder us now? Camilleri would turn around to them and say, what we're going to do is we're going to go to some remote location. We're going to tie you up to some like a tree or something. And then we're going to leave to give us enough time to escape. So, and that way you won't be harmed. And then he would turn to Beckett and he would whisper to him, he would say, they can't go back. They can't, they can't live. Camilleri fully intended to kill the girls that night. Now we're in the morning of October 5th, 1997, around eight o'clock. They drove to a place called Fiddler's Green Creek and they would uh, take the girls out of the car, force them out. They would drag them to the, uh, like a new, the creek that was right there. They forced the girls to take off all of their clothing. And then what they did was they commanded the girls to clean themselves in the water very, very, very thoroughly. That way they could get rid of any evidence of the men um, on their bodies um, and to show that there was no sexual assault. The girls were tied up as well. And Camilleri then goes to Beckett and says, kill them both now. Beckett complained and said, that's not fair. Why don't I have to kill them both? This was your plan. All of this was your idea. Why are you making me kill them? So Camilleri took his knife, put it against Beckett and threatened him. He said, if you don't do it, I'll kill both of them and I will kill you. So Beckett, uh, he agreed. So Camilleri just went back to the car and sat there and waited. So Beckett had tied Nicole up to a tree and then he grabbed Lauren who was tied up as well um, just behind her back and he forced her to the creek where he then forced her to her knees and and put her face in the water and he essentially was trying to drown her. According to Beckett, uh, Lauren put up a fight and she was thrashing around a lot. She was struggling um, at one point, she, like, you know, kicked his leg and he kind of fell into the water a little bit where he got, he got his knee wet, he said, and he said that pissed him off. So he took out his knife and he began to stab at the side of Lauren's neck. He said he jammed it in there a couple of times and in the process, he even cut his own finger, which pissed him off more. Um, and then he pulled the knife out and... Basically, she fell into the water face first. She was thrashing around. She was struggling to breathe and survive. Um, and then he knew she was dying. So he just walked away from her. Nicole couldn't see what was going on, but she heard enough as Beckett was walking back up towards her. And she was about 100 feet or so away from the creek. Beckett said that as he approached Nicole, she was crying and struggling to free herself. And she said, you're going to kill me now, aren't you? He said he told her to then shut up 
and he took his knife and as she was in a sitting position he slashed her throat uh, three times he said all this did was it caused her to thrash around to struggle she was like shaking trying to get loose she couldn't scream he could tell she was trying to scream but nothing would come out because her th her throat was cut and he's you know he said that she wasn't dying so i kicked her i kicked her a few times in the head I then took my, my boot and I pressed it against her chest um, to force her to stop struggling, to force her to stop moving. He then says he took the knife and he stuck it into that hard part of the neck. I'm not exactly sure what part that meant, but he said he stuck it in her throat and he just like, he pushed it in um, and she still didn't die. So she was struggling, she was in horrendous pain she was at this point she's being tortured um and so he then takes the knife out and using both hands he jabs it directly into her her heart which still caused her to struggle um and thrash around and then he finally kicked her a few more times and she slowly stopped moving and then she slowly stopped breathing and then she was dead he went back to make sure lauren was dead as well and she was. Beckett then went back to Camilleri and he told him the job was done and Beckett was like did you see the demon and Beckett was like I don't even know what that means um, but the two of them drove to a place called Theodore Lookout and they went to like an overpass and it was there where they burned all of their own blood-stained clothing the ropes they used the um, tools they may have used the, the gags they used, they burned all of it. They then went to a place called Lake Burley Griffin and they took both of their knives and they just chucked it into the lake. Um, and to my knowledge, I don't believe the knives have ever been found. Camilleri then realized, oh shit, the TV we left, that might lead someone to us. So they went back to the original campsite to pick up the pink TV, but when they got there, it was already gone. Someone had already taken it. They then drove um, to another part of town where they thoroughly cleaned the car. He said they spent hours trying to clean the car out. So Beckett confessed all of this on November 12th, 1997. He would end up leading police to where the girls' bodies were, and they were, of course, still there. Um, and so they were able to recover them and return them to their families for proper burial. Camilleri and Beckett were then both charged with kidnapping, assault, sexual assault, um, and murder. Police, just for good measure, were able to go to each location where Beckett said they stopped to assault the girls, and they actually found pieces of evidence that they were able to later use during trial. On June 26th, 1998, Beckett would end up pleading guilty, and he did so at the Supreme Court of Victoria. He would be sentenced to life in prison, but with the possibility of parole after 35 years. Camilleri would go on trial because he refused to plead guilty because he kept saying, I wasn't there. Nope, wasn't me. Beckett's lying. He just denied, denied, denied. His trial started on February 15th, 1999. But it was the pink TV that sunk him. Um, that's, that led every, that confirmed that Camilleri was in fact in that area that night. Not to mention all of the other small pieces of evidence they found, not to mention the fact that Beckett testified against Camilleri at his trial. On April 27th, 1999, Camilleri was found guilty of all charges and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Which I guess is kind of strange because Beckett was the admitted murderer of both of the girls, but he was given the option for parole where Camilleri, who didn't actually kill the girls, I mean, he did force Beckett to do it, um, but he got no parole. So I'm just, I'm curious as to why Beckett didn't get that, why he was given a parole option. My guess is I maybe because he testified against Camilleri and because he confessed, uh, that's the only reason I can think of. Quite honestly, it's amazing these two monsters were even out there free to begin with. Between the two of them, they had about 150 previous criminal convictions against them. 
It included theft, assault, sexual assault of minors. It's just unbelievable that they were even out there in the world at all. But we're not quite done with Mr. Camilleri because after he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, he would rat out to a cellmate that he hadn't killed two people, he actually had killed three people. Turns out um, he would have also killed another teenager by the name of Prudence Prue Bird. Apparently, uh, Prue's father had sexually assaulted Camilleri many, many, many years earlier. And so I guess he was trying to exact revenge and he had kidnapped Prue from her home to find out where her father was, but I guess Prue wouldn't uh, divulge the information. She refused, so he would end up strangling her to death. Um, and then he hid her body somewhere where she still to this day has never been found. But he would then be charged with her murder um, after he was already convicted and he was found guilty and he uh, was sentenced again to life in prison. So, I mean, he's never getting out of prison to begin with, but um, he at least got convicted of that one too. There is now memorials set up for the two teenage girls, um, the Vega school girls. Um, and I know people, from what I've been reading, people uh, visit the memorials almost like a tourist site so that people could pay respects to these innocent souls that were taken far, far, far too early. But that is the end of this case. Um, I, as usual, hope you found it interesting. Um, if you want to see more stories from me, I have a lot more videos on here, of course, but if you want to see some shorter form stories in about like three minutes stories, um, you can head on over to my TikTok page. It's also called Making a True Crimer. I will always have it in the description below. Um, I have well over 2,000 videos there, um, so you have a whole lot more videos to watch. Um, yeah, so go ahead and give me a follow over there because I still post content there as well. If you have a case you would like me to cover on here eventually or on TikTok, um, you can email me. My email is mikey at truecrimer.com. Uh, the email is also in the description below. But first, go to my link tree, which is in the description below, um, and go to my Crimer case list and scroll through the names. It's alphabetical for the most part um, to look for the name you might want to recommend to make sure it's not there already. If you're on a computer, you can search by hitting Control F. If you're on a phone, hit the three dots at the top, then go to Find and Replace, and then you can search for the name. If the name does not show up, then you can email me the uh, the case information, really just the name, where it happened and when it happened, and I can add it to my list. I get a lot of emails, so it may be a while before I respond to you. Um, and also, please be very patient because I pick my cases that I cover randomly. Um, so it could be covered tomorrow or it could be covered a year from now. I'm not sure. So just be patient with me. Um, and then how I decide if I cover it here on YouTube or over on TikTok is just how much information there is on the case, simply put. Um, if there's a ton, then I can do a video here. If there's minimal information, then I'll do it on TikTok. And then lastly, if you would like to support me in any way, um, in my link tree below, you also have my merch store where we sell t-shirts, we sell hoodies, we sell mugs and a wine glass and other things. Um, some of the items you can customize um, to change some of the words. Um, there's also like rainbow font um, that you can do. And we are currently on Etsy, but Adam, who makes my merch, whose information is also linked below, um, he is planning on switching to another website. When that happens, I will let you guys know, and we'll have some like updated merch as well. All right, that being said, we are at the end. So until the next case, I will uh, see you on the next case. So as usual, hello, true crime. No, that's the, that's the opening. That's the opening. What am I doing? Hello, hello, hello.